Well, friends, uh, let's attend to God's word, shall we? We're going to look at Judges chapter 15, and I'm going to read from verse 9. The Philistines went up and camped in Judah, spreading out near Lehi. The men of Judah asked, why have you come to fight us? We've come to take Samson prisoner, they answered, to do to him as he did to us. Then 3,000 men from Judah went down to the cave in the rock of Etam and said to Samson, Don't you realize that the Philistines are rulers over us? What have you done to us? He answered, I merely did to them what they did to me. They said to him, We've come to tie you up and hand you over to the Philistines. Samson said, Swear to me that you won't kill me yourselves. Agreed, they answered. We will only tie you up and hand you over to them. We will not kill you. So they bound him up with two new ropes and led him up from the rock. As they approached Lehi, the Philistines came towards him, shouting and shouting. The Spirit of the Lord came upon him in power. The ropes on his arms became like charred flax and the bindings dropped from his hands. Finding a fresh jawbone of a donkey, he grabbed it and struck down a thousand men. Then Samson said, with a, with a donkey's jawbone, I have made donkeys of them. With a donkey's jawbone, I have killed a thousand men. When he finished speaking, he threw away the jawbone and the place was named Ramath Lehi. Because he was very thirsty, he cried out to the Lord, You have given your servant great victory. Must I now die of thirst and fall into the hands of the uncircumcised? And God opened up the hollow place in Lehi and water came out of it. When Samson drank, his strength returned and he revived. So the spring was called en Hakore, and it is still there in Lehi. Samson led Israel for 20 years in the days of the Philistines. Let's pray, shall we? Lord, we thank you that you have not left us without guidance. We thank you for your word. And Lord, I do pray, Lord, that you would anoint my words by your spirit. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I don't know about you, but I, I simply love a hero. I love the stories, you know, Marvel comics and everything like that. There's these amazing Heroes, but there is a sense, isn't there, of, of an unreality about that. And therefore, there's been a rise in our culture of the cult of celebrity. These people who get in front of the cameras or we, we inspect their lives to great detail and we find their weaknesses and their foibles and, and somehow we identify with them. You know, that, that's why probably that there was more grieving over the death of Lady Diana than there was over the death of Mother Teresa, even though they died within seven days of one another. National outcry, national mourning for a woman who was a celebrity, who indulged her weaknesses and wasn't ashamed by them, where Mother Teresa was another woman who was holy and pure and just almost we felt that her life was unattainable for us. We see this also, don't we, uh, in, in our characters. You look at the way that uh, modern media has portrayed the, the figure of Batman, for instance. You know, the 1960s, when it first came out, he was a hero. He was unbeatable. He was always on top. He never showed any weaknesses, knew all, knew all the answers. But if you look at the latter part of the 20th century with our deconstructionism that we so often like to cling on to, we see Batman rewritten. We see him written as a man who is out for vengeance at the murder of his parents. He's deeply flawed and deeply broken, relationally broken, almost like an anti-hero, someone that we can sort of relate to who doesn't rely upon superhuman abilities, but actually his own intellect. Do you know, in this day and age of postmodernism and post-postmodernism, I wonder if we've traded the idealism of the hero for the authenticity of the celebrity. 
it's almost we feel that that's that the authenticity is a, a redemption of our misguided heroism. But do you know that's not what the Bible shows us and it's not what God has called us to be. He's called us into a true humanity that is reliant upon his spirit. And we see this in the book of Judges. We are in a series at the moment looking at encountering the spirit. We're looking at what the Bible says about working in his power. And what we want to be able to do is to build a confidence that our faith is truly grounded in a Trinitarian way by the Father, the Son, but also by the power of the Holy Spirit. We believe that it's the empowering of the Spirit that enables us to live in a way that's pleasing to him. And other than that, we cannot please God, but by and through God. And it's only when we're truly filled by his Spirit that we can become all that God has intended for us to be. Yes, we can be by his Spirit. We're called to be naturally supernatural. So we're looking uh, in the book of Judges, a, a nation uh, of Israel who God raises up repeatedly again and again and rescues them by filling leaders with his spirit to help people come back to him to relationship with him. Now, as Warren so helpfully pointed out last week, the word judge is God raised up judges it's not from a judiciary point of view the word judge is used, but actually it's better seen as a saviour or a rescuer. And every time God uses normal people to bring about the redemption and the saving of a nation and the drawing it back to God. And repeatedly we see the saying, the Spirit of the Lord came upon them. So last week, we looked at the character of Gideon. Gideon was a man who was the weakest of the weak uh, in all of Israel, and yet God chose him to bring about the redemption of the people. And that's so often the way that God works. He doesn't work by power. He works by his spirit. And as so often we see, Gideon started well, but actually, he ended badly. Uh, Warren pointed out, gold, glory, and girls. You see, the key to God working in us and through us is not in our own natural abilities, but it's in our willingness to be allowed to be used by God and not to take the glory to ourselves. And so often we see the falling of many people through the Bible and actually through society when they start to glory in their own abilities. Psalm 115 says this, Not to us, Lord, not to us, but to your name be the glory. So we're now coming to this character called Samson. Samson's known for two things. He's known for his strength, his hero character, but also he's known for his weakness, you know, Delilah. That's his sort of celebrity character, that weakness that we see. And what we want to look at today is what happens to Samson when the Spirit of God comes upon him and hopefully to see that we can expect the same by the Spirit when he comes upon us. You see, we cannot live without the transformative power of God. So what can we learn well, first of all this, the Spirit of God comes to free us from our apathy and our fear. Verse uh, 11 of chapter 15. Don't you realize, said the people of Judah, that the Philistines are rulers over us? What have you done to us? Samson was the last of the nine or so judges uh, for Israel, And each time we see a further drifting away from God and a further drifting to comfort away from God. By the time Samson is on the scene, the Philistines had subjugated and ruled over Israel for 40 years. That's a generation and a half. 
And I think actually we're about a generation and a half, uh, if not more, here in New Zealand, away from being a pe people who have feared the Lord and followed his ways. The Israel's Israel's uh, culture and belief systems had, became, had become fully that of the Philistines. They had forgotten the ways of the Lord. They had intermarried. Samson went and got himself a Philistine wife. And the people had become apathetic and comfortable. But the Spirit of God was not comfortable with their apathy. He awakened them through raising up a hero, a leader, a judge, a rescuer. But these people weren't ready for it. They wanted the Philistines to continue to rule over them because they were apathetic and they were full of fear. But despite their apathy, God was wanting to set them free. And God was orchestrating a confrontation in order to release them from their oppressors, to bring them back to a passionate following of the Lord God. And the Spirit wants to do the same in us. You know, interestingly, during the lockdown, researchers have said that the Google searches had really spiked around the word prayer and spirituality. And yet the reality is when we came back from lockdown, many churches, ours included, actually saw a drop in attendance. Many people were moving churches or even forgetting to go back to church. They had grown apathetic. And I wonder if we're at risk of that, friends, as followers of Jesus. But the good news is Jesus wants to set us free by his Spirit. The Spirit comes to set us free from our fear and our apathy. Secondly, the Spirit comes to set us free from that which binds us, from our bonds. Verse 14 of chapter 15. As Samson approached Lehi, the Philistines came towards him shouting, and then the Spirit of the Lord came upon him in power, and the ropes on his arms became like charred flax, and the bindings dropped from his hands. You see, the Lord set Samson free by his power, by the power of the Spirit of God. You see, though Samson was bound by ropes, when the Spirit came, he was set free. Outside of the Lord, we are all captives. And this is exactly what we see in Samson later in his life. When he trusted in his hair rather than the Lord and it got cut off. He was powerless to break free from that which bound him and he was put into slavery. There was hardly any mention in Samson's life about the Lord. He was not reliant upon him only when he was in excessive danger or threatening to die. So when he was thirsty after the battle or right at the end, when his life was about to end, he called on the Lord. You see, here we find that internal battle between the hero and the celebrity in the fact that he removed God from the equation of his life. And so often we can do that, can't we? Many of us, all of us outside of God, are, are bound by addictions by substances, by life habits, by thought patterns, and we cannot break free. They cannot be beaten by self-improvement. They can only be tempered by that. They cannot be broken. But in Christ, we can be set free. When the Spirit of God comes, He sets us free. You see, it's the work of the Spirit, friends. Once addicted we can now be set free like, like Samson was. You see, those things physically that we see in the Old Testament that the Spirit of God does in setting Samson free can be availed to us by the outpouring of the Spirit. The Spirit comes to set us free from that which binds us. Psalm 107, 
Verse 14, he brought them out of darkness and the shadow of death and he broke their bands apart. Well, how about Jeremiah 30, verse 8? It shall come about on that day, declares the Lord of hosts, that I will break the yoke off their neck and tear off their bonds and strangers will no longer make them slaves. Friends, this promise is for us by the Spirit. The Spirit comes to set you and me free from that which is set to bind us. The enemy looks to bind us up, but the Spirit comes to set us free. What else do we learn about encountering the Spirit? What is there for us? Well, thirdly, the Spirit comes to transform our weakness. As I said, we are powerless, really, to, cha- to affect change in our lives. The lesson of Samuel is not about strength, it's about reliance. Where do you rely? Where do you lean? Are you leaning on the Lord's side? You see, Samson was a Nazarite. Nazarite. In other words, he had a special vow over his life not to drink alcohol, not to eat unclean food, not to shave his hair, and to go nowhere near anything that was dead. There was nowhere in the narrative of God other than what Samuel said to say that Samuel's strength lay in his hair. See, John the Baptist himself was a Nazarite as well. In other words, he followed all the things that Samson did, and yet his hair was not giving him supernatural strength. Samson thought it was because of his hair that he had his strength, but it wasn't. It was by the Spirit. It was only when it came upon him that his normal physical strength became supernatural strength. And Samson forgot this, and so often we do, friends. Though Samson was physically strong, he was morally and spiritually very weak. He was prone to revenge. I was only doing what they did to me. Look at the story. Read it over. It takes about 10 minutes to read the story of of Samson. You'll see it's a cycle of revenge and hatred. Warren Wiersbe, great uh, biblical expositor, says this of the life of Samson. Samson illustrates people who have power to conquer others but who cannot conquer themselves. He says the Philistine fields are on fire but he could not control the fires of his own lust. He killed a lion, but he could not put to death the passions of the flesh. He could easily break the bonds that men put on them, but the shackles of sin gradually grew stronger on his soul. Instead of leading the nation, he preferred to work independently and as a result left no permanent permanent victory behind. He was remembered for what he destroyed, not for what he built up. He lacked discipline and direction, and without these... His strength could accomplish little. He failed to check the impulses that began early in his career, and 20 years later, those very things killed him. So often, friends, we go, if I just try harder, I'll be able to get through this. I'll save myself. But there is no righteous act that can save you. Jonathan Edwards, the great revivalist, said this, Your righteous acts can no more save you from hell than a spider's web can save a rock from falling to the ground. The key to transforming our weakness is not striving but repentance. You see, repentance is a recognition of our weakness and a longing for God's strength. As we realize we cannot save ourselves and we need a savior, we turn to Christ in repentance. And then we are saved. The Spirit comes to set us free and to save us. It's only as we acknowledge our weakness is the point that the Spirit can set us free. It's while we were sinners that Christ died for us. Does this mean that we accept our weaknesses and we revel in them? No, we recognize our weaknesses and we realize that we need help. That's why Paul says 
He will boast in his weaknesses so that Christ's strength may rest upon him. That's in 2 Corinthians 12. Paul's not saying he'll indulge himself, but he, rec- that, but he says as he recognizes those weaknesses, he knows that God will transform him. What else do we learn that the Spirit wants to do? Well, the Spirit wants to come to make real our salvation, to make real our salvation. In the beginning of Samuel's life, or before Samuel's life, the angel said to Samson, sorry, Samson's life, he said, he will begin the deliverance of Israel. Uh, That's in chapter 13, verse 5. But actually, the true deliverance of Israel was only in Jesus. In the story of Samson, we see a reflection or a, a mere shadow of that which God wants to do in our lives through Jesus. The people of Israel were subjected to a foreign power. They rejected Samuel's Why do I keep saying Samuel? They rejected Samson's handling and his salvation by handing him over to them. But in doing so, they brought about the very salvation that they needed. Handing over the source and the means of their salvation only to death to find that they are saved. That sounds like Jesus Like Samson, it is we who are oppressed. And when we realize our need, that's when our salvation comes. That's when the Spirit comes to set us free. It's at the very point of weakness. When Samson has no eyes, when he's beaten to an inch of his life, that he's put between those pillars, that he repents before God. And says, Lord, forgive me. And so it is at that point his salvation comes and the salvation of all of Israel. And that is the point that we discover that transformation occurs in our lives when we repent and turn to him. It's, we, it's when the power of Christ comes upon us. For many of us, we stand at a point where we'll either implode or cry out to God. You see, encountering the Spirit of God sets us free from the idealism of the hero and the authenticity and the pressures of the celebrity and calls us into freedom and wholeness, into the humanity that Jesus wants us to live in. The Holy Spirit wants to set us free from our apathy. He wants to break our chains and set us free from those things that bind us. He wants to transform our weakness into a true spirit-filled strength. And he wants to reveal and make real to us our salvation. Now friends, I think that today, even this morning, there are some of us who are feeling quite apathetic. Or maybe are in deliberate rebellion are stubborn, or maybe are just bound. The Spirit of God wants to come and set you free. And so I want to pray for us now. Let's pray. Lord, I pray that now by the power of your Spirit, you would come, that my friends and I would encounter your Spirit in a fresh way. Lord, shake us from our apathy and our fear. Lord, release us from our addictions, from those things that bind us that we simply can't be set free from. Lord, break us free from idealism or, or Lord, from the weakness of authenticity. And bring us into you, Lord Jesus. For we want your spirit to come upon us in power.
Let's just wait on the Lord for a second. May God set you free and may you know the freedom that there is in Christ today. Amen. Oh, let your will be done. We pray.